Evening all, it's Dr. Helen from Dorset Allergy again. So in our next video, I thought I would have a look at anaphylaxis and adrenaline auto injectors and answer some questions and share some questions that I usually get asked um, about myths around anaphylaxis. So I'll start off with a few that I always get asked. So firstly, I always get asked, is it true that the reaction gets worse every time you're exposed to the food that you're allergic to? And the answer to that is no. So anaphylaxis is a really tricky thing because we can't predict when it's gonna happen. And it's not true that the reaction is gonna get more severe each time, thankfully. Um, we do know it's more likely to occur if you are poorly on the day that you are exposed to the food that you're allergic to. So if you have a cough or a cold or a tummy bug or something. And we know it's more likely to occur if you're um, asthmatic um, particularly if your asthma is badly controlled. So if you have asthma it's, and food allergies, then it's crucial that your asthma is controlled. And also from an asthmatic point of view, um, your asthma is probably much more likely to cause you serious problems and carries a much stronger risk of death, if I'm honest, than anaphylaxis. So it's really, really, really important that you follow your asthma management plans carefully. And speak to your doctor or your asthma nurse if your asthma um, is not well controlled. We also know that there are things called cofactors when it comes to anaphylaxis, and they are things that are likely to make an allergic reaction get worse. So for some individuals, if you were to eat the food you're allergic to and then go and exercise, then that would be more likely to cause a more serious reaction to occur. Um, and that is, you know, in part, some of the reasons around if you are having anaphylaxis, one of the really important things to do is to not move around. So you need to um, lay flat and lift your legs up if you possibly can. Um, or if you're having breathing difficulties, of course, you need to sit upright when you're having anaphylaxis, but ideally not move about. Now, of course, if this is a young child or a toddler with anaphylaxis, then you go with the flow. You, you, you shouldn't stress them, so you can't like pin them to the spot. But for older people, it's best to stay put when you're having anaphylaxis and re receive the treatment where you are. Um, we also know one of the other cofactors um, are things like stress. Um, for women, if you're around the time of your period, you're more likely to um, have a more, sort of trigger a more significant reaction if you were having anaphylaxis it may get worse it's a, it's a cofactor um and things like travel uh so if you're tired um then those things can occur so it's it, it's it's quite a complicated thing the other thing that people will say to me is it true that if you've only ever had a mild reaction then you'll never have anaphylaxis and again you may judge from what i've just said then no that's not true you an anaphylaxis can occur at any point um, as you probably know, my son had milk and nut allergies and his reaction to milk always used to be quite static. So on the whole, he would just get hives and swelling. A couple of times he would have vomiting. Um, and then I remember we were in Dubai, we gave him sausages. We didn't know that they contained milk and he had anaphylactic symptoms. Um, and then another time he had anaphylaxis was when... Um, we were in Weymouth and I gave him ice lollies and ice lolly balls and... I was a really bad parent and didn't chat the packet, didn't think that a nice lolly would have milk in. Um, and again, he had anaphylaxis. And looking back, the times that he had anaphylaxis were around times he was having issues with his breathing. Um, but he was only, I think, two and a half to three and a half when he had anaphylaxis. And so he wouldn't have been diagnosed with asthma at that point. But actually, he did go on and develop asthma. And at those points, he was having a lot of coughing and wheezing episodes. So he probably... Um, did have issues with his breathing and that may well have been one of the reasons that the anaphylaxis was triggered. He's alive today to tell the story so um, don't worry. Um, so some of the other questions, um, so there's a mum of a child with a nut allergy and her daughter doesn't have an EpiPen so that's an adrenaline auto injector and um, she told her friend that that only happens if you have asthma and is that true? So there are three different types of adrenaline auto injectors available in the UK. So they are EpiPen, Jext and Emirates. And um, the EpiPen and the Jext come in 150 microgram and a 300 microgram dose. So essentially they're junior. So um, most children below the age of eight, dependent on your weight, are probably going to have 150 microgram dose. Um, and once you hit 30 kilos or, there, or thereabouts or just a bit before, you're going to be moved on to the 300 microgram dose. 
and the emeraids are available in a 300 microgram dose and a 500 microgram dose. Um, there are guidelines about who should receive an adrenaline auto injector and those are from the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology so you can look them up if you wish. And essentially, we recommend, they recommend that you should have an adrenaline auto injector prescribed if you have a food allergy and you have asthma. Because as I've said, if you have asthma and an IgE mediated food allergy, so those are the ones that give you immediate symptoms, um, then you are at higher risk of anaphylaxis. So it's recommended those individuals carry an adrenaline auto injector. Um, if you've ever had anaphylaxis before, then it's recommended you have uh, an adrenaline auto injector. So in that instance, they're talking about anaphylaxis to food, um, spontaneous anaphylaxis. So that can be anaphylaxis without an apparent trigger, um, anaphylaxis to bee or wasping venoms, um, and um, some of these rarer mast cell disorders that can trigger anaphylaxis. If you've had anaphylaxis to medicines, so drugs, then um, it's not recommended that you carry an adrenaline auto injector. And some people are surprised by that. Um, and the reason is that generally whenever we as health professionals prescribe medicines, we always say to you, are you allergic to anything? So if anybody's had a severe reaction to, say, penicillin, then they would say, yes, I'm allergic to penicillin, please don't give it me. So the only time potentially that you're going to receive penicillin is perhaps if you were unconscious and another healthcare provider like a paramedic came along, felt that you needed penicillin to, I don't know, maybe treat meningitis and um, they give it to you. Now in that setting, they would also be carrying adrenaline. So if that person then develops anaphylaxis, they would be able to treat it. Um, it is important if you have a severe drug allergy to think about wearing an alert bracelet um, so that it can warn health professionals if you became unconscious or anyone else of the severe drug allergy uh, drug allergies that you have. But there should never really be a reason that you're gonna be accidentally exposed to a drug. So um, the British Society of Allergy don't recommend that you need an adrenaline auto injector if you have a drug allergy. So for anyone with a food allergy who doesn't have asthma and who hasn't had anaphylaxis, then you don't have to be prescribed an adrenaline auto injector. But there are some circumstances in which we might. And they all really are based on having a sensible conversation with you. So um, if you told me that you have a food allergy and you're going on holiday to the middle of nowhere and you're really worried because food labelling perhaps isn't as clear and if you have a severe reaction, you're going to be miles from the hospital, then that is a good indication indicator to have an adrenaline auto injector and that's in the guidelines that you consider it for those people going you know, to remote holiday locations. Um, if you have reacted to trace amounts of food, so perhaps the foods that say may contain or not suitable for nut sufferers perhaps or um, made in a factory, so foods that um, basically have the risk of contamination. Um, if you've reacted to those foods, which are generally meaning that you're you have a low threshold for reaction because you're just reacting to small amounts, then again, we could consider, is it right for you that you have an adrenaline auto injector? Now, the British Society of Allergy guidelines are relatively old. I think they're from 2014. And they recommend that if you have a nut allergy, that we consider prescribing an adrenaline auto injector. And in Southampton, where I used to work, there was a big centre, we would prescribe it to anyone of school age with a nut allergy. And that was based on the fact that if you look at deaths from anaphylaxis, which I'd just like to highlight, thankfully are rare. So anaphylaxis is common and sadly is on the rise, but actually the deaths from anaphylaxis do remain at around 30 a year in the UK for all causes. So anaphylaxis to drugs, food, bee and wasp sting allergy, spontaneous anaphylaxis. And if you think about food allergy itself, you know, it affects three to five percent of children. It is common and anaphylaxis, as I said, is common, but death is rare. And that's really important to remember when you're placing your level of risk and concern. But whenever there is a death from anaphylaxis, then quite rightly, often it comes to um, the attention of the media because it's an unusual occurrence and, and tragic, frankly. And therefore, those notes of that patient are always thoroughly reviewed to look at what learning could we have from this case? Is there anything that could have been done differently to prevent anaphylaxis, to have treated it better, to have avoided the situation, basically? Um, and when they've looked at all the cases, then it certainly used to be that if the deaths from anaphylaxis tended to be in asthmatics and tended to be in those with nut allergies. And therefore, it was recommended that you consider it for those with nut allergies. Now, if 
it, um, deaths from anaphylaxis tend to be reviewed, I think, about every 10 years. So there's recently been another review. And what it showed, as I said, is that deaths from anaphylaxis are going like that. Uh, thankfully, adrenaline auto-injector prescriptions are going like that, suggesting that perhaps we're prescribing more appropriately and more readily for those with allergy. Um, but actually, when you look at children and deaths from anaphylaxis, it seems that that's more likely to occur now in those with milk allergy. Whether that's because there's been a change in things like, you know, schools are nut free and people are much more aware of nut allergies. They're aware of the potential severity of nut allergies. So there's a lot more caution around it. Um, perhaps is it that people are less exposed to nuts? Has, is that the reason it's gone down or are there other reasons? And yet when you think about milk, it's certainly not avoidable. It's, it's it's everywhere and it you know I was always shocked by how many products had milk in so I was always surprised with like Bisto gravy that the beef gravy didn't have milk in but chicken gravy did and it was things like that that until I had a child with milk allergy I had no idea and it's there's easily you know there's easy contamination and I'm not suggesting that we make everything milk free because where do you draw the line do you milk free and then are we egg free everywhere and then are we wheat free and then do we eat um, so it's really difficult and the reality is growing up as a child with allergies you have to learn about risk and how to manage risk and about your safety and about always asking before you eat anything and always checking the packets and always checking the packets again and always asking in restaurants and all those safety precautions and that's the best thing we could do for our children really is give them the tools they need to grow up safely with a food allergy but the confidence to grow up safely with a food allergy, to still feel they can live a full life, which you absolutely can, to still travel, you can, to still eat out, you can, to still go to parties, you can. Um, always upsets me greatly when families don't eat out, don't go on holiday, don't let their little ones go to parties because of worry. I totally get it, but it's sad. Um, so whether the guidelines will change in keeping with that, I don't know. Um, and but those are the main indications of when you should be prescribed one and when you consider it when you're looking at food allergy. Um, for me, I think it's always about a conversation to be had with the family. So if I had a family that said, uh, my child has a food allergy, we absolutely can't eat out because we're so anxious about anaphylaxis or an adult. I said, I can't eat out and I would feel better if I had an adrenaline auto injector, then I would prescribe it. I mean, at the end of the day, the adrenaline auto injectors cost us about 30, well, you know, the NHS about £35 a pen. It's, it's very reasonable. We prescribe much more expensive stuff than that. And if it's going to affect someone's quality of life, then I would prescribe it. On the other hand, if I had a really clear conversation with someone who should be prescribed an adrenaline auto injector, and I felt that despite my best efforts, there was absolutely no way they were going to carry it, then I may not necessarily prescribe them. The next question I often get asked is how many adrenaline auto injectors should you be prescribed and um, is it okay, you know, why is my GP perhaps only given me one? So NICE guidelines and the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority guidelines are that everybody should be prescribed two adrenaline auto injectors, which they should carry with them at all times. And that means all times. So if you're going to clinic, you should be carrying your adrenaline auto injector from the car to your clinic appointment, to your doctor's appointment, to your school, to your work to the park, to the shops. It seems overkill, but um, in a previous video, I talked about the fact that, you know, severe allergic reactions can happen from contact. So it could be that perhaps if your child with a nut allergy is on the swing, if the child before was eating their peanut butter sandwich on the swing and has left residues of it on the swing, it could trigger a reaction. It could trigger a severe reaction. I want to put it in context of still trying to live your life, of not being so overly paranoid that you get to the swings and you wipe it all down. And we can't live like that. But just knowing that reactions can occur anywhere, even if you're not planning on eating, they can occur from contact. And that's why we state the importance of carrying the adrenaline auto injectors. So everyone should always have two. If you are a primary school ch child, then I always give four. Two to be kept at school at all time and two to be kept with the parent that you're then, you know, taking those to clubs, to grannies, to school on the walk and back from school on the drive. Um, but primary school age children can't carry their adrenaline or twist injectors in their school bag. And it's unreasonable to expect a parent or a caregiver to check the adrenaline or injectors into the school office and out of the school office every day, especially with COVID when no one wants you in school. Some primary school children, I give six. Um, that shocks my colleagues. 
The reason I give six is generally if those families are divorced. So, you know, I'm in that situation. Dad collects from school on a Wednesday. I don't see him and therefore he would need his own adrenaline auto injectors for my child. And I then would do the pick up after school on the other days. So sometimes where there's no clear link of contact, again, you can't expect people to be trying to spend their lives figuring out who's going to swap adrenaline auto injectors. And it's about being safe. But six would be the most because if you go to grannies or your clubs or your whatever, then you should be taking one with you. For a secondary school ch child, I give three. So two that that child should be keeping with them at all times in their school bags. And then, because I know what secondary school children are like, having two of my own, um, one that's kept in the school office. The challenge with secondary schools is they're often big campuses, they're spread out. But at least then, while you know, you've lost your bag, you're having anaphylaxis, someone could run to a school office for you. Not you, because you're having anaphylaxis, you need to stay put, but to get your pen. Adults only ever need two. Um, so I hope that clears that bit up. Um, when do you use it? You use it if you show signs of anaphylaxis, which to make life simple, we call A, B, C. A for airway, B for breathing, C for circulation or conscious level. So signs of anaphylaxis with the airway may be that your mouth may get really swollen with your tongue. You may not be able to swallow properly. You might be dribbling. Your voice might go hoarse. A baby's cry might go hoarse, like you've got a sore throat. Or you may start coughing. And, and from experience with Ethan, that's what he did. He was like, <coughs> <coughs> and it sounds like your throat clearing. The challenge you have with little ones that are weaning is that, as you probably know, they always cough when you're feeding them. Um, but it's constant. So if it doesn't clear and it doesn't settle, then you might think, is that anaphylaxis? B is for breathing difficulties. So um, noisy, wheezy breathing, um, breathing rates increased. If you're dropped them, we might listen to your chest and hear changes, or we might check your oxygen level and see that it's dropped. And C is for conscious level or circulation. So little ones often go quite floppy. Um, older people will tell you they feel dizzy or faint. Um, and if it's a worst case scenario, somebody may collapse and we might notice that their blood pressure drops, their heart rate might go up, and that might be a severe sign of anaphylaxis. And also we add in their D for deterioration. So if you have sort of some of the milder signs of an allergic reaction, which we would class as hives, and swelling, vomiting, tummy pain, hay fever type symptoms, those are what we call mild to moderate. So you would take an antihistamine and you would watch to see if things get better. If despite having antihistamines, your symptoms continue to progress and keep getting worse, then we would use an adrenaline auto injector. And you give it into your thigh through clothes, through, um, you know, just move your phone or your keys out of the pocket, but you give it through the clothes. And once you've given the adrenaline auto injector, then you ring 999 after that and you say, this person is having anaphylaxis. And if after five minutes, things are no better, then you use your second adrenaline auto injector. And it always makes sense to us that you give it into the other leg. Um, and that's because when you're giving adrenaline, there's um, what we call vasoconstriction. So narrowing of the of the blood vessels because they're trying to push the blood pressure up. And so it kind of makes common sense that you want good blood supply to where the adrenaline is going. So we think we give it in the other leg. But there's not clear guidance on that, actually, because the evidence doesn't say you have to. So if you can only get to one leg, you just give the other in the same leg. But generally speaking, I, I teach that if you can get to the other leg, you give it in the other leg. Um, and then you, you know, are waiting for the ambulance to arrive, which they should have. I mean, ambulances services are under pressure at the moment, but they should have arrived by then. Um, it, one of the questions is, is it a problem if you give your adrenaline auto ejector to you or your child and they didn't need it? And the answer to that is no. For the most part, adrenaline is not going to cause harm. Um, and I always teach, if in doubt, give it. And it's not an unusual scenario that you come to clinic and I unpick the situation with you. And we might say, do you know what? Actually, I think what was going on there was blah, blah, blah. Like for once, I had um, one person say to me, um, it was an adult actually, and they said, you know, I went to the restaurant. I hadn't been out to the restaurant before. I was really nervous. And I put my adrenaline auto injectors on the table in front of me. And I thought, I know what's coming next. And because of the anxiety that person clearly had, they were always going to have what they thought was anaphylaxis because they were just so nervous. 
And it used to be taught that if you have a sensation of something in your throat, that that's potentially anaphylaxis. Um, so essentially, he felt like they couldn't breathe. Their food had been prepared, as far as they were aware, without the substance they were allergic in, but it, it was the anxiety level. So they gave themselves their adrenaline auto ejector. Absolutely no harm came, and absolutely they were not told off. Um, but we used it as a learning tool to talk about, hey, you know, how did it feel when you had it? Um, well done for giving yourself it. That's actually quite a brave thing to do. You know, they always say it was never as bad as I thought. But we talked about anxiety and talked about do we need to address about building confidence around eating out. Um, so for most people who are healthy individuals, um, adrenaline is not going to cause harm. To the point of, you know, we used to work with a psychologist who um, would work with older children, teenagers who struggled with the worry about using their adrenaline auto injectors. And that was my own son. And so they did a, a lot of work with them around building confidence. And the end point of their um, psychological work was that they would come into the day ward and give themselves their real adrenaline auto injector. And the most that would happen really is the heart rate went up a bit, but they were fine and they were safe and it was approved. And you can see they're not going to come to harm. What other questions did I have? Um, does giving a, an adrenaline auto injector frequently cause psychological problems to small children? N no. You know, what causes the problem is usually around the feelings that were involved in that particular situation of probably the stress and the worry that was on that caregiver's face. Um, the child may well remember how that felt, you know, the fear that was spreading through. And it's not the act of giving the adrenaline, it is probably the act of the situation and the worry that was there. And to be honest, you know, when we bring people into hospital to do a food challenge to show can you eat this food safely or not? Sometimes people will react. And when they react, um, if that child is old enough, we get them to give their adrenaline or to inject to themselves if they were having anaphylaxis, or we would get the parent or caregiver to give it. And always people find it a really useful tool. They say, it was not as bad as I thought it was, um, and they feel better. And I do completely understand the worry. So Ethan was prescribed EpiPens. He had anaphylaxis twice. The first time, I didn't recognise it was anaphylaxis. I, at that point, wasn't trained in allergy. I was a doctor. And he had this sausages that contained milk. And he was coughing. And we were like, oh, that's really weird. What's going on? And um, I, you know, we did give antihistamines. And we gave him his inhalers because he still had a, he had a blue inhaler at that point. And, um, and he got better. And then when I relayed the story, I was told by his consultant that, that was anaphylaxis. When it then happened again, I still, there was just a bit of me that was like, oh, it's probably not that bad. And I think it's okay. You know, the amount of people that say, I wasn't sure whether to give it. So I drove to a &E and sat outside a and &E to see if things got worse. And, you know, the challenge is, it's just not the right thing to do. Because A, we've talked about we shouldn't move because it can make um, the anaphylaxis get worse. If in doubt, give it some of the reasons that people die from anaphylaxis are that the adrenaline was given too late um you don't want that to be you or your child if in doubt give it you know we can sort any problems out that arise from there um if you're worried about the anxiety that may come from that we can work with that we can we can unpick that you can see a psychologist we can get therapy for you your child but we can't bring back somebody if they're dead. So if you are having anaphylaxis, your child is having anaphylaxis, you're not sure if they're having anaphylaxis, you use the adrenaline. Um, and I can't stress that enough to doctors because when you look at the amount of people that present to A&E, about how often they are given adrenaline when they need it for anaphylaxis, it's really poor. To the extent now that the resuscitation guidelines have changed, they used to say give adrenaline, but also give antihistamines and give steroids and because of the confusion because people would give antihistamines and steroids which take a lot longer to act um, they have now taken that out of the resuscitation guidelines and it says if someone is presenting with anaphylaxis you give adrenaline and I can't stress that strongly enough um, somebody said to me why do people still die um, even if they've been receiving the adrenaline and so we talked about sometimes people will die because it's given too late. Um, there are sometimes issues around the fact that some people are on medications that will block the action of adrenaline. They tend to be adults and they're on heart medicines. So 
um, things like beta blockers or blood pressure tablets that will, will block the action of adrenaline. For most people, the benefit is going to be that they're on the heart medicines because you're much more likely to have issues of heart attacks and strokes and reasons that they're started on those medicines rather than anaphylaxis. And, you know, hope, and as I said, death from anaphylaxis is rare. So, but that is one of the reasons that can happen, um, that it's given too late, that potentially it's given in the wrong way. Um, I did hear a, a difficult case once where, you know, sometimes when we train how to use adrenaline auto injectors, we train on ourselves and as parents, we train on ourselves. And then in the heat of the moment, this parent gave it to themselves and not to their child. So it's about, you know, simple things like that. The child didn't die in that instance, but it is sometimes adrenaline is not given in the right way. But sometimes it's a multitude of factors that perhaps you've got the asthma, it's not well controlled. You've had too much of the um, um, food that you were allergic to, a high dose of it that you perhaps moved around, um, you know. Uh, uh, and sometimes these reactions are just catastrophically progressive and we don't fully understand why one person dies and most don't. You know, you know we look at all the ways that we could improve their allergy care, that we could have prevented it from happening. But often the things that we look at in the prevention for happening are around, why was that person given that food that they were allergic to? Um, were they carrying adrenaline? Um, did they know how to use it? If, if they did know how to use it and they had their adrenaline, sometimes we can't stop these things. But I just want, you know, I, I reiterate it lots because I see so much, allergies destroying people's lives because of the fear and there has to be some fear and sense around anaphylaxis but putting it into perspective of you know as crazy as it sounds you are more likely to be knocked over walking down the road in fact I think statistically you're more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to die of anaphylaxis and it's not to say you know take it lightly, don't care about it, but it's to say, please live your life and enjoy it and get the support you need to manage your allergies well. Um, I'll do a separate video on how to use the adrenaline auto injectors. I just want to make sure I've got all three of them for you, but that's probably a run through of the most common questions we get asked. Um, so I hope you found it useful.